What Next is brought to you by Progressive. Are you thinking more about how to tighten up your budget these days? Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over 700 bucks on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. A little off your rate each month can go a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. Myrtle Beach, South Carolina is the beach. It's also the perfect place to enjoy the holidays. Here you get all the holiday cheer you can handle, plus 60 miles of beaches and endless fun. You may be wondering, what can I do at the beach at the holidays? Well, it's a great time of year for horseback riding along the shoreline, fishing from chartered boats, or going golfing at any of the 80-plus award-winning courses. So this year, take a holiday from the average holiday season at the beach. Plan your getaway to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, at visitmyrtlebeach.com. Alex Salmon is a political reporter here at Slate, and I got a pretty good sense of his point of view when I asked him to tell me what he thought of Nancy Pelosi's farewell speech the other day, the one on the floor of Congress. Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, I, I, found, it, I, found, it, I found it interesting, I guess. Madam Speaker, as we gather here, we stand on sacred ground, the chamber of the United States House of Representatives, the heart of American democracy. I will never forget the first time. Pelosi was there to give up her gavel and depart leadership after two decades. But her white suit and soaring rhetoric about working across the aisle with her Republican colleagues, that did not move Alex. I think if you we're reading too much into the substance of the speech. You'd be, you'd be a little discouraged that that uh, that maybe the Democrats still don't really know the political moment that we're living in. But although, why do you say that? Why do you say that? Oh, I just think it, you know the sort of nature of of politics as it's practiced by congressional Republicans and as it was being uh, extolled by uh, Pelosi in this most recent speech. I think there's a pretty sizable disconnect. This hard-bitten cynicism is part of why I got Alex on the line. Because I wanted to talk to him about everything that happened after this speech. A passing of the torch that seemed at once surprising and predictable. The frontrunner to helm that new generation is a native New Yorker, 52-year-old Brooklyn Democrat Hakeem Jeffries. One by one, in what seemed like a choreographed dance, Congress members lined up behind New York Representative Hakeem Jeffries to fill the leadership void. Hakeem Jeffries, is he getting uh, a lot of support there on the Hill? Yeah, he just got a big endorsement today from Nancy Pelosi, who did not say that she would endorse a successor yesterday. Alex says, in a lot of ways, it went down like this because Jeffries is the last man standing. The leadership triumvirate, the octogenarians that are one, two, and three in the House on the Democratic side have been in power for a really, really long time, and they haven't done a great job of building the bench. A lot of young talent has come through and been unable to to rise to the ranks of leadership because we've had this leadership team for so long. Does the fact that Hakeem Jeffries is sort of the usual suspect here, like the person everyone thought would be leading the Democrats and now he is, does that mean that his turn in leadership is going to be dull? I I I really don't think so. I I would be shocked. Uh, maybe you know, maybe pleasantly shocked, but but shocked all the same. I think even for a minority leader, it's going to be chaotic at the very best. Uh, you know, a lot has changed since Pelosi took over in two thousand three. You know, this is a very different world. I think a lot has changed, and I think it's going to be there. Will be some very interesting challenges. And has Hakeem Jeffries changed with the caucus? I would say that he has not. <laughs> He's young, but in, in a lot of ways, he's, uh, he, he's an older model in terms of uh, democratic politics. Today on the show, Democratic leadership just got some new blood. But is that going to change anything? 
I'm Mary Harris. You're listening to What Next? Stick around. This podcast is brought to you by TD Ameritrade. Thinkorswim is a dynamic suite of trading platforms designed for every kind of trader. From the advanced tools of Thinkorswim Desktop to the streamlined interface of Thinkorswim Web to the convenience of a mobile app, no matter where you are on your trading journey or how you like to trade, there's a Thinkorswim platform designed for you. Learn more at thinkorswim.com. Around New York City, there was a time when Congressman Hakeem Jeffries was nicknamed the Barack of Brooklyn. Like Barack Obama, Jeffries is a fan of soaring and sometimes stinging rhetoric. And like Barack Obama, he rose to power fast. He started in the New York Assembly, running three times before winning a seat there in 2006. He made a name for himself, passing laws that constrained the NYPD. But nothing too radical. New York just wasn't thinking like that back then. Jeffries didn't stay in local politics very long. After just a few years, he was running for Congress. He won that that race in 2013. He he enters uh, Congress and rose really quickly after that. And it, it, a really quick ascent. You know that that I think is is an important part of this too. This is an incredibly ambitious politician. By 2018, Jeffries was chairman of the House Democratic Caucus, the fifth highest ranking Democrat in the House. His legislative record is a little thin. He's become known instead for his style. As a House impeachment manager, he quoted Biggie Smalls on the floor. When he enthusiastically supported Nancy Pelosi's final term as speaker, he gave a raucous speech that ended like this. Let me be clear, House Democrats are down with NDP. Nancy D'Alessandro Pelosi, the once and future Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, I proudly place her name in nomination. May God bless her. May God bless the United States of America. How do you rise that fast? Because it really is stunning. And I know that people in New York have talked to him as like, talked about him as, oh, he could be mayor. You know, like clearly people have stars in their eyes for him. Yeah, absolutely. I think that he, I think he's a very good politician. I think that, that, you know, he has the traits. If you talk to Washington people, what they'll say about him is that he is really a a friend to everyone, right? He, He like really makes an effort to sort of like make nice with new members. He's technically a member of the of the Progressive Caucus and identifies as a progressive. At the same time, he's clearly an ally of the moderate and, and business wing. He's an ally of the establishment. He kind of has absented himself from the most contentious debates on policy and other things. So I think he's he's really very talented at the politicking part of politics. And, and I think that that really allowed him to uh, rise quickly. To get into his role in leadership, he beat out California Democrat Barbara Lee, who's incredibly progressive. She's best known for voting against the Iraq War. And he barely eked out a win here. Like, I think he won by 10 votes. What does that tell you about his support in the caucus? Yeah, that's correct. And it's interesting, too, because seniority, like incumbency, is a huge, huge thing in the Democratic Party. And Barbara Lee, as you mentioned, made a reputation for herself opposing uh, the excesses of of the war on terror, you know, she was a 10-term incumbent at this point, and, and Jeffries had only been there for four years. And so for him to to win this position was was a real upset. And the sort of thing that rarely happens in in the party. I think that he had done, you know, he's done a job of positioning himself as a sure ally to leadership. And he's done enough to sort of make himself present in the various uh, caucuses all over the party. And I think that you know, he managed to pull out uh, what I think was a really surprising victory. Hmm. It seemed to sting for the progressives, too, that he won this position. Definitely. Yeah. You know, coming off the heels of the 2016 election, you know, there were these debates about where we should go policy wise as a country, where the Democrats should go policy wise as a party. And obviously, progressives were on a huge upswing at that point. You know, the addition of AOC or the election of AOC, things that look like they're headed in a much more progressive direction. And yet Jeffries is able to pull out this victory and it really did sting because it felt like 
not only was this not indicative of where the party was headed, where the country was headed, but it was really one of the few opportunities to secure a leadership spot. And they, they don't come up for auction very often. Immediately after Jeffries assumed his leadership position, this tension spilled out into the open. A Politico article speculated that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez might be looking to primary Jeffries. She and others seemed rankled by his support for charter schools and banks in particular. When I asked Alex which policies Hakeem Jeffries put forward that rankled progressives, he didn't single any out. Instead, he pointed to just how faithful Jeffries has been to the Democratic old guard. Jeffries is absolutely a sort of, you know, he's a, he's a party man all the way through, but the party has changed. And it's not the, you know, it's not the party that Nancy Pelosi came up in. The progressive caucus, the congressional progressive caucus, this uh, session will have 103 members, it looks like. It's the biggest it's ever been. Technically, Hakeem Jeffries is a member, right? Yeah, yes, right. So Hakeem Jeffries is a member as well. This is what's interesting, though, is is Hakeem Jeffries identifies as a progressive. If you ask him, he'll say, I'm a progressive, I'm a progressive, uh, until he's blue in the face. But he also has been a, a regular opponent of progressive politicians on campaigns, progressive priorities and policy. And at the same time, he's a member of of the progressive caucus. And so, you know, he it, you kind of get a sense the way he's kind of on all sides of the table uh, in a lot of ways. And that's aided him in his in his career. But he also made a lot of enemies with with progressives in both in New York and nationally. And, you know, I think that those those tensions are going to become a lot clearer now that he's, uh, you know, set up to be at the helm of, of the party. Yeah, it's funny listening to you. I'm reminded of that old phrase, a friend to all is a friend to none, because it seems like Jeffries has really made this effort to make inroads with a lot of different kinds of people. And yet at the same time. There's, at least from the progressive side of things, this idea that you say you're one of us, you're not one of us. And Hakeem Jeffries himself has his own way of saying how he's different from the progressive caucus. Like he told The Atlantic, you know, I'm a progressive, but there's a difference between me and the hard left democratic socialists. You know, there will never be a moment where I bend the knee to hard left democratic socialism. That's an intense thing to say. Right. And it's it's very clear who that's who that message is meant for. That's meant for his his neighbor, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. That's meant for the the House and Senate reps in his own backyard who are both uh, DSA endorsed in, in the state of New York. So the interesting thing is that, you know, even in even in New York was someone who was in the good graces of the Cuomo uh, Democratic machine. He was not part of this burgeoning DSA socialist uh, political moment that's that's happened in the state in the, or at least in the city in the last handful of years and he feels very strongly about that and uh and has been willing to you know to to i think sometimes go to great lengths to make clear that that he does not intend to play nice with that group yeah is the knock on him that he's just antagonistic to the group is or is there something else is there something more concrete where progressives people who identify as as, I guess, hard left progressives point to someone like Jeffries and say, uh, I disagree with you here. There are a handful of things I think that, that really sort of like stick out. One of them is his opposition of, uh, to the Green New Deal. Um, so that's something that was, you know, a big priority for progressive Democrats. And of course, Nancy Pelosi was a big opponent of the Green New Deal, too. Right. Yeah. So that, you know, comes as as no surprise, right? He's, he's, he's a party man. Like we said, if Pelosi doesn't like it. No surprise he doesn't like it. But we've also seen, you know, in someone in a, in a district like his, it's very, very blue uh, in, in Brooklyn, in central Brooklyn. You know, it's, it's been common for politicians to say, you know, I'm not going to raise corporate PAC money. I'm not going to take money from, you know, from various industries that, you know, the Democratic base finds to be objectionable. And Jeffries doesn't do that. And I think that he uh, has really bristled at suggestions that he should. Yeah. There's one more thing that I think has really rankled progressives, which is – Jeffrey's creating this alliance with Josh Gottheimer, a New Jersey congressman who's one of the most conservative Democrats in the House. And the point of this PAC that they formed together was to protect incumbents against primaries from their left. So it was at the same time an alliance with someone that progressives have issues with, and it was also kind of a warning shot to people who might be coming for him, because there were rumors at some point that progressives would come for Hakeem Jeffries. 
Yeah, I think that, um, you know, so Team Blue Pack is what it was called. It didn't become like the most consequential political spender in this cycle. But I think that it is a really telling development. And, and I think it goes both to the heart of the sort of the contradictions of, of Hakeem Jeffries as, as a Democratic politician and, and also sort of why progressives might be skittish about his leadership. In, in 2021, when they decided to form this pack, everyone in the House was looking forward to, to 22 and saying, it's going to be very hard to defend our very small House majority. That is the absolute top priority. We have to do that. And so for very early in the cycle, for Jeffries to, to strike this accord with Josh Gottheimer, who's, you know, as you said, one of the most conservative Democrats anywhere in the country, not to protect the House majority, not to protect the good of, of the party's control of the chamber, but to ward off progressive challengers, just, just shows you a really weird set of priorities. And I think that, I think, was something that was pretty alarming to some progressives. And I think, you know, it's it really embodies all the contradictions at, at the core of his sort of political persona. After the break, what will Hakeem Jeffries' leadership actually look like? This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. What's one thing you'd purchase with a little extra savings? A weighted blanket? Smart speaker? That new self-care trend you keep hearing about? Well, Progressive wants to make sure you're getting what you want by helping you save money on car insurance. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. Discounts like having multiple vehicles on your policy. Progressive offers outstanding coverage and award-winning claim service. Day or night, they have customer support 24-7, 365 days a year. When you need the most, they're at their best. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com and see why 4 out of 5 new auto customers recommend Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who save with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. This episode is brought to you by Best Buy. This year, let Best Buy be your holiday hype partner. Whether you're searching for exciting gifts or trying to snag the hottest holiday deals, or looking for ways to simplify the giving and receiving experience, Best Buy is here to help. Best Buy's got the best assortment of impactful tech gifts, along with fast and free fulfillment options and great deals all season long. Maybe you're looking for an air fryer to help the aspiring foodie in your life unlock new recipes, or perhaps a new phone or camera for an aspiring filmmaker who's turning their passion into a side hustle. Maybe you're on the hunt for a new smartwatch to support a friend's wellness journey. No matter what you're looking for, Best Buy is your gifting destination for everyone on your list. And Best Buy makes it easy to get your gifts how and when you need them with free next day delivery on thousands of items, as well as same day delivery and in-store pickup options. Shop great deals on gifts now at Best Buy. With Hakeem Jeffries almost guaranteed to take over Nancy Pelosi's role in January, there is this question of how he's going to work with both Democrats and Republicans in the House. Some wonder if his old beef with AOC might resurface. The tension between the two of them seems personal. There was a fight that broke out within the party over whether or not AOC would get a position on the Energy and Commerce Committee. AOC was up for that position. There was a, a position available in New York. She had been there long enough. There was basically no case against her ha you know, taking this position on the committee. But Hakeem Jeffries led what was essentially it was almost like a mutiny in some sense. It was it was a sort of like a shock campaign to keep her out of that position. And and she and, and Jeffries have locked horns uh, repeatedly in the past. And he was able to keep her out of that position. And, and, and so that was something that left a really bad taste in the mouths of progressives as well. And the question is, you know, is Jeffries going to get in the way of progressives getting these promotions that they're expected to get? Is Because if he is, then we're going to have a very acrimonious, you know, two years in the House. Then, then you know, the, the sort of factions that exist are not going to be able to strive for this sense of unity that you're hearing so much uh, talk about right now. He's going to be a Democratic leader in a House that's pretty divided, which means he's going to need to not just work with moderates, progressives, but also with Republicans. 
And Jeffries has this reputation of basically ignoring Kevin McCarthy. Like people will ask him about Kevin McCarthy and he'll be like, Kevin who? So I guess my question is, how do you do that? Like how do you, when you know you're going to need to work with the other side and with the leader of the other side, but you've also cultivated this very intensely antagonistic relationship with them. How does that work? You know, I think that it's going to be tough. I don't know what Kevin McCarthy is going to come up with in the next two years. It'll be one question. Uh, you know, it may be that that Jeffries is not called upon very much to to work with him because there might not be that much to work on. I mean, if you look at their, you know, the uh, Republican agenda right now, there's it's it's not a long list. Um and outside of, you know, cutting taxes, the opportunities I think are going to be are going to be fairly marginal. Um, I will be as curious as anyone to see how how that relationship works. I, I, I think you're right to point out that, uh, yeah, it's not one where there's a, a substantial body of goodwill built up. Yeah. Yeah. Here's something I keep coming back to when I think about what the next couple of years are going to look like in the House with Hakeem Jeffries leading the Democrats, which is that. A weird thing about someone from New York being put in this high-profile leadership position is that New York just really messed up in the midterms, lost four House seats, and a lot of folks are pointing at New York's Democratic Party. Has Hakeem Jeffries shown any signs of grappling with that and sort of folding that understanding into how he leads moving forward? Definitely not. <laughs> yeah, that is something that I think is is very notable. Um, it doesn't really surprise me. He has not been behind any of any of this sort of like the calls for introspection on what went wrong in New York. And I think that that's that's troubling. I think that it's something that he bears some responsibility for as well. And obviously, you know, in Brooklyn, he has for years has not you know has put his name behind a handful of candidates, but for both the state assembly and the and the Senate. He has something, you know, that's akin to a little, you know, it's, it's like a local machine here. And at the same time, Democrats in Brooklyn fared terribly in the last election. I mean, he, he, you know, he has his candidates. He's very involved. And he didn't say, you know, I take responsibility for this. We need to look inward. We need to get to the bottom of what happened. And I think that that hurts his, his, his position in Congress right now. I think that the fact that New York was the sort of black eye on, on the Democratic performance nationwide weakens his position and and not in an insignificant way. Yeah. I keep thinking about this line in an Atlantic profile of Hakeem Jeffries from a little while back, because to me, it sums up the tough position he's in as leader, which is, you know, this was a year ago, and the writer was basically profiling Hakeem Jeffries and trying to get to the heart of, like, why do progressives not see him as one of their own? And is he really going to lead the Democrats in the House? And at some point he said part of why Hakeem Jeffries is seen as the next leader in the House is because no one can come up with an alternative. Like when he asked insiders in the Democratic Party, they were just like, this is who we have. And the hard thing about that is... It might behoove the party to have more competition for Hakeem Jeffries. Doesn't really behoove Hakeem Jeffries to have more competition for his role, though. <laughs> and so then the question becomes, who's going to do that work of, like, getting the new leaders pulled up to keep the sort of churn going that will keep new ideas in the party? Yeah, the question is, is right, how how to keep developing uh, the young talent in the House and and. The problem with that is that age really corresponds strongly with ideology right now. I mean, just the the fact of the matter is young people are just more progressive and, and those trends aren't going away at all. Um, you know, part of Hakeem Jeffries' job is going to be right to develop that young talent, to get those young politicians who are waiting in the wings ready for these leadership positions, these consequential roles. But he's also been pretty committed to opposing people who who support these policies. And so you know, herein lies the, the great tension at the heart of the Democratic Party is it's a youth party. In essence, I mean, you know, Democrats in the last election, I think, lost every age bracket over 40 and they did great. So how do you reconcile those things? That's a really tough challenge. And, and it's going to be it's going to require him to, to change his approach a little bit if he's going to be successful at it. Alex, I'm super grateful for your time. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. 
Alex Salmon is a politics writer at Slate. Quick fact check on what Alex said at the end there. Democrats lost every age bracket over 45, not over 40. But Alex's larger point about the Democrats being a youth party, that stands. Democratic House candidates won younger voters by 13 points. All right, that's the show. If you're a fan of what we're doing at What Next, the best way to support us is to join Slate Plus. Go on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus and do it right now. What Next is produced by Elena Schwartz, Carmel Delshad, and Madeline Ducharme. We are getting a ton of support right now from Anna Phillips, Jared Downing, and Victoria Dominguez. We are led by Alicia Montgomery and Joanne Levine. And I'm Mary Harris. I'm going to be back in this feed tomorrow. I'll catch you then. This episode is brought to you by Best Buy. Whether you're searching for exciting gifts or trying to snag the hottest holiday deals, Best Buy is here to help. From air fryers for the aspiring foodies in your life to smartwatches your fitness friends will love, Best Buy is your gifting destination for everyone on your list. Best Buy makes it easy to get your gifts how and when you need them with free next-day delivery on thousands of items, as well as same-day delivery and in-store pickup options. Shop great deals on gifts now at Best Buy.